Good evening, everyone. My name is Vance Williams, and it is my pleasure as chair of the Sterling Prize Committee to welcome you to SFU's 2023 Nora and Ted Sterling Prize in Support of Controversy. This ceremony is taking place in the WAS Center for Dialogue in downtown Vancouver, and is also being streamed online. I would like to acknowledge that we are gathered today on the unceded traditional Coast Salish lands, including the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Musqueam Nations. The land gives us much, including the ability to meet in this beautiful space and to take part in an important dialogue on a timely topic. Throughout tonight's event, we are glad to offer both closed captioning and ASL interpretation. For those of you joining us online, you can turn on the closed captioning by clicking the CC button at the bottom of your screen. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. If you need help with closed captioning or have any other technical issues, please message hosts and panelists and someone will help you. There will also be a link to a live updated transcript in the chat. This event is being recorded and links to the video, transcript and other resources will be sent to all participants in the coming days. I'd like to remind everyone of our community guidelines, which you can see on this slide and in the chat. We ask you follow these guidelines to make this discussion as safe and as inclusive as we can. Most importantly, there will be zero tolerance for those who promote violence against others based on race, ethnicity, national origin, sexual orientation, gender identity, religious affiliation, or different ability. For those of you attending in person, we will be holding a reception immediately following tonight's event. We hope you can join us for a, a beverage, dessert, and a lively discussion. All right, so now I'd like to share a little bit of context about the Sterling Prize. As many of you know, the Sterling Prize is the result of the vision and generosity of Nora and Ted Sterling, who in 1993 established an endowment to SFU to recognize work that provokes and contributes to understanding of controversy. It can be awarded to work in any field including the fine arts, humanities, social sciences, natural sciences, and education. To be eligible for the prize, the work must be the object of and or present a meaningful analysis of the conduct or consequences of controversy. It should be also more than simply controversial. It should, be, it should present new ways to, of looking at the world to be daring and creative, decidedly unconventional and distinctly untraditional. The Sterling Prize celebrates work that challenges complacency, but also meets recognizably high standards and is morally and ethically sound. Every year, there's a call for nominations. A committee gathers in the spring to consider nominations, and after much very lively discussion, the group comes to a consensus decision. The committee is meant to be broadly representative of the SFU community. Committee membership is partially renewed each year with the intent that students, faculty, staff, and people of diverse backgrounds are all represented. So I'd like to take this opportunity to, to acknowledge and introduce this year's Sterling Prize Committee for their, and thank them for their service. Uh, so the members this year, in addition to myself, were David Zandvliet, who's a professor in the Faculty of Education. Aaron Barley, who is actually here with us this evening, uh, who's a senior lecturer from the Department of Biological Sciences. Uh, Alexandra Lysova, who's an associate professor from the School of Criminology, and some of you may be aware, it was also last year's recipient of the prize. Uh, Marissa Marsh, who is a staff member from the BD uh, School of Business here at SFU. Uh, and finally, Isabella Wang, who is a graduate student in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. I would also like to thank all the staff and volunteers who helped make this event tonight uh, possible, uh, as well as my colleagues from the SFU Public Square who are managing the event. And, and I can say in all honesty that this event would be impossible without all their hard work and dedication. This ceremony highlights one of the core missions of the university. 
We explore controversial and difficult subjects in a way that prioritizes careful and thoughtful analysis. That is what tonight is all about. We are here to celebrate work that contributes to advancing social progress and creating a more inclusive and accountable society. Before I introduce this year's recipient, Nicole Luongo, I would like to explain how the event will be managed uh, tonight. So Nicole will give us a lecture, after which I will moderate a Q&A with Nicole. Uh, whether you are here in person or online, uh, you will be able to ask questions using Slido. Uh, that's a slide with an O, uh, which is a site you can easily access on your phone or computer. Uh, you do not need to sign up for an account or download an app. Uh, so you can see on your screen uh, a QR code that you can use to access Slido, uh, and I encourage you to try it, it right now. So uh, it, uh, if you scan on this code and then enter the six-digit uh, code shown on this slide, which is SP, as in Sterling Prize, 2023. Please ask your questions at any point during the lecture using Slido. You can also upvote questions that others ask. Uh, we will do our best to ensure questions cover a diversity of topics and point of views. Uh, and please follow our community guidelines to make this discussion as safe and inclusive as possible. The Sterling Prize lecture always covers controversial topics, but sometimes the topic can evoke strong personal emotions, and we want to be sure that anyone in our audience who is affected by the discussion has the resources available if they want some help coping. Uh, you will find links to a list of resources and support services on our screens and in the chat function on your right. All right, so finally, and most importantly, I am pleased to introduce Nicole Luongo as the recipient of the 2023 Norrin's Ted Sterling Prize in Support of Controversy for her ongoing work supporting progressive drug policy approaches and advocating for those stigmatized and marginalized for the use of drugs. Nicole is a systems change coordinator with the Canadian Drug Policy Coalition, CDC, CDPC, my apologies, which has collaborations with researchers in SFU's Faculty of Health Sciences. In her role, she advances education and advocacy in support of a legislative framework that would make all psychoactive drugs legal, safe, and government regulated. In recognition of her work and on behalf of the Sterling Prize Committee, I would like to present Nicole Luongo with the 2023 Nora and Ted Sterling Prize in support of controversy. Thank you very much. Uh, can folks hear me? Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Nicole. Uh, before launching into things, just a, a brief kind of list of thanks to, of course, the Sterling Prize Committee and the chair of the committee, Dr. Vance Williams, uh, to Rosetta Canada, uh, Melissa Shaw, and the entire communications and marketing team who put uh, the event together. Thank you to SFU Public Square for hosting under the direction of Janet Weber and Program Manager Seth, to Dr. Jane Polkingham, Senior Advisor in the Office of the Provost and Vice President Academic, Office of the Provost and Vice President Academic, and to my colleagues, Vita and Shane at the CDPC for nominating me for this award. Um, I'm gonna try and cover a, a fair bit of ground in the next however many minutes here. Uh, I will try and watch the tempo at which I speak, but uh, feel free to flag if I'm starting to get a bit too rapid. I am a little bit anxious, and I'm thus going to just sit, I think. Uh, I want to acknowledge that uh, a former winner of this award is Donald McPherson, uh, the founding ED of the CDPC. Uh, and in preparation for tonight, I watched Donald's talk uh, from 2017. And this is the graph that he opened with, and I've also chosen to open with it. Uh, and it is the death rate uh, for folks using drugs and dying a fatal overdose. And 2017 was the year after BC's provincial health officer declared a province-wide public health emergency uh, after documenting a sharp increase in overdose fatalities. 
So this is the graph that Donald used taken from the BC Corners report from 2016. This is the same graph updated to capture the years 2016 to 2020. And this is the graph updated to include 2022. Let me just make sure. All right. So last year, at least 2,272 British Columbians died from overdose. This year is on pace to exceed that record. Well over 12,000 people have died since the emergency declaration that is just in BC. And that has amounted to over six deaths per day in the last few years. Now, with the exception of a few very vocal outliers, most people can look at the deaths depicted in these graphs and agree that they constitute a problem. However, this tends to be where consensus begins and ends. To some, these deaths represent an opioid crisis. To others, they represent an addiction crisis. But to me, my colleagues, other people who work in the drug policy and drug policy advocacy space, and people who use criminalized drugs, these graphs represent an unregulated drug crisis. In other words, while drug use is a complex and nuanced social phenomenon, the massive increase in drug-related deaths we have seen since 2016 is actually an extremely simple one. They have been caused by precisely one thing, drug prohibition, otherwise or colloquially referred to as the war on drugs. These figures therefore prompt one to arrive at one of two diametrically opposed and mutually exclusive conclusions. One, the war on drugs has been a catastrophic failure. Or two, the war on drugs has been an unparalleled success. Perhaps controversially, I adopt the second position. I believe the war on drugs has been an unparalleled success. And I say this because I do not see the war on drugs as ever having been meant to prevent drug use, to promote individual or public health, to enhance community safety, or to promote the right to life, liberty, and security of the person as detailed in section seven of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, or to promote any of the human rights outlined in the seven United Nations human rights treaties Canada has acceded to since 1976. In fact, I adopt the position that was designed to do just the opposite and on a global scale. So the key differences between me, someone who sees the drug war as a success, and those who see it as a failure are the lenses through which we understand power, profit, and ultimately the function of the government in a nation state that was founded on stolen land and that actively participates in a global system of monopoly capitalism. And before launching into drug policy specifically, as I talk about the function of the government in a nation state that was founded on stolen land and that actively participates in a global system of monopoly capitalism, I would be remiss not to acknowledge what we have witnessed for the last six weeks and are continuing to witness in occupied Palestinian territories. The fact that neither our federal or our provincial governments or our Vancouver municipal one have joined a growing international call for an immediate ceasefire. or dared to name the Israeli state's assault on the Palestinian people for what it is, a genocide, is telling. We cannot separate domestic policies and interests from foreign ones, nor must we ever become desensitized to preventable death, no matter the context or the cause. So who am I and how, do I, how did I arrive at the beliefs I'm about to share with you? What authorizes me to speak about drug policy? As has been mentioned, I am the Systems Change Coordinator with the Canadian Drug Policy Coalition. We are a national policy advocacy organization that works as a coalition with over 50 organizations across the country striving to end the harms of drug prohibition. Uh, I have a bachelor's and a master's degree in medical sociology from the University of British Columbia. Uh, I began a PhD in 2017 at Oxford where my research plan was to explore how the transition from exclusively criminal to kind of hybrid criminal and medical or public health adjacent approaches to illegal drug use nevertheless function as a form of social control. 
In other words, my research questions revolved around how making drug use medical remains firmly rooted in the same legal and political state apparatus that birthed the war on drugs. However, my own alcohol and drug use got in the way of that plan. Uh, and before I worked in policy or earned any academic credentials, uh, I was an alcoholic and a drug addict, and I still am. I am also clinically insane. And I use those words very strategically and very intentionally here. According to my medical records, I am severely mentally ill and I have severe alcohol and drug use disorders. I have spent a cumulative total of years of my life within institutions, including countless admissions to psychiatric wards. I've been at every local hospital, abstinence-based addiction treatment centers, eating disorder treatment centers, detoxification centers, and homeless shelters on Vancouver's downtown east side. I've been told by many psychiatrists that the best I can hope for is a life where I'm under constant supervision within the walls of a locked institution. Others have been more generous and have said I can maybe maintain some form of part-time employment, provided it is low stress, predictable. Um, I have not gone that route. But I will say that normally when people gather to hear, uh, you know, folks with my history talk, they expect to hear kind of an inspirational story about how one overcame or recovered from addiction. And for years, I did tell that story. I spent a long time in the rooms of 12-step programs like Alcoholics Anonymous, where I learned that I had a chronic, progressive, relapsing brain disease rooted in selfishness and self-centeredness, and that the only solution was to pray, to meditate, to strictly monitor my every thought and behavior, and to immediately confess my every transgression because I could not be trusted, and more importantly, I could not trust myself. Yet despite being abstinent from alcohol and illegal drugs for quite some time now, I no longer accept this conventional wisdom about addiction. I no longer see addiction as a disease, brain-related or otherwise, and I no longer identify as being in recovery. Rather, I view addiction through the same lenses as I do drug prohibition, those of power, profit, and the function of government in a nation state that was founded on stolen land and that actively participates in a global system of monopoly capitalism. So I'm not here to tell you how I went from sick to being well. I am here to tell you how prohibitionist drug policy environments make all people and all communities sick and hopefully uh, to think about how we can collectively recover. So what is drug prohibition? For our purposes, Drug prohibition refers to a legal framework that prohibits or makes into a criminal offense activities related to the possession, consumption, distribution, movement, and manufacturing of certain substances. Canada's federal regime of drug prohibition is called the Controlled Drugs and Substances Act, or CDSA. And under the CDSA, the drugs that people are prohibited from possessing and so on are referred to as controlled substances. The CDSA is a legal document, and as with all legal documents, it is therefore a political document. Ostensibly, controlled substances are prohibited because they are dangerous, uh, but I suggest that the inverse is actually true. Controlled substances are far more dangerous than they need to be because they are prohibited. And a clear case study of this already exists with alcohol. Again, Canada's history uh, of alcohol or with alcohol is fraught because it intersects with our history of settler colonialism. I won't give a full history lesson here, but briefly, prior to colonization, some indigenous peoples on these lands used fermented drinks and herbs. Their purposes for doing so were quite different from how alcohol was being used in Europe, which was largely for entertainment and recreation. Beginning in the 16th century, European traders arriving in what would become Canada began exchanging alcohol with indigenous peoples for furs, with, uh, for furs and other goods. And they soon realized that promoting overconsumption was an effective tool for exploitative bargaining and of colonization. I'm going to fast forward a bit to the 18th and 19th centuries, where simultaneously a temperance movement was growing across Europe and it was being imported here. Temperance was an organized social, political, and moral movement instigated by upper-class Christians who sought to limit or ban alcohol. Emphasis is often placed on the moral and religious dimensions of the movement. Because temperance activists were vocal about alcohol being a cause of sin and social decay among respectable whites. But it is equally important to emphasize that temperance held a strong economic dimension. 
In Canada and on the West Coast especially, early economies were based on natural resource extraction and then sectors associated with industrialization. This birthed communities of wage earners that were male dominated and whose members drank heavily to cope with isolation and the physical toll of high intensity manual labor. Yet wealthy settler elites of the day depended on having access to a class of cheap expendable laborers to exploit. And workers were more difficult to control and extract profit from when they were intoxicated. What's more, by the 19th century, white working class women were consuming more and more alcohol. Women who drank were seen as undermining norms of femininity and interfering with a broader project of settler nation building. What we now consider first wave feminism emerged partly in opposition to women who drank. First wave feminism was almost entirely within the purview of the upper class and groups of wealthy white Christian women campaigned for voting and other rights on the basis of being able to raise sturdy offspring that would contribute to the spiritual and economic health of the nation. This dynamic was further complicated by the arrival of immigrant settlers from Eastern and Southern Europe who were considered less racially pure than settlers from Britain and France. Ultimately, it was this combination of settler land and resource theft, white Christian morality, socioeconomic hierarchies, and gendered control that converged and culminated in the passage of three pieces of legislation. And what many folks aren't aware of is that the Indian Act actually contained one of Canada's first drug prohibitions. The act was, of course, fundamentally an assimilationist document. And in 1884, it was amended to make it a crime for an Indigenous person to purchase or consume alcohol or to enter a licensed establishment. It was also a crime to sell liquor to an Indigenous person. The core rationale behind this was that Indigenous people who were by then being dispossessed of their land and traditional ways of living would not diligently work the so-called farmland that had been allotted to them through the reservation system if they were permitted to drink. Indigenous alcohol prohibition was therefore done in dual service of preventing racial mixing and generating profit for the settler state. Paradoxically, the only way for an Indigenous person to possess alcohol after the passage of the Indian Act was to become a citizen through enfranchisement. This first required demonstrating sobriety. The Duncan Act was also passed in 1864, followed by the Canada Temperance Act or the Scott Act in 1878. The Scott Act was a national framework that allowed regional governments to opt into prohibition, and right away it ran into trouble. The various legal challenges that were launched, launched on the basis of its constitutionality are responsible for much of the legislation underlying Canadian federalism today. And I will point out that the only period that saw the entirety of Canada adopt alcohol prohibition was from 1918 to 1920, or 18, yeah, 1920, sorry, as a temporary wartime measure. For these years, opponents of prohibition were largely silenced because most considered drinking establishment to be places where foreigners congregated and plotted against the British Empire and therefore the war effort. From 1921 to 1925, five provinces repealed liquor prohibition, BC included. And the key arguments that ended prohibition in BC were, one, too many people were ignoring the law and drinking illegally. Simply put, people liked drinking and they weren't going to let the law get in the way of that. Two, prohibition contributed to the expansion of organized crime and political corruption. This era saw a steep increase in the number of bootleggers and rum runners who produced alcohol domestically for sale both here and across the U.S. border. Especially because prohibition lasted in the U.S. till 1933, rum running was highly lucrative for organized crime syndicates. And liquor flowed freely across the borders with local presses throughout Canada, often reporting incidences of police raids, border violations and arrests that resulted from the illegal sale of liquor. They also reported that the RCMP, who are in theory expected to patrol Indigenous people's movement on and off reserves and ensure that they didn't drink, were getting mixed up in organized crime. At one point, the Newfoundland government was even accused of being involved in organized crime, with headlines from a local paper asserting that the premier had turned the board of liquor control in a, into a covert bootlegging operation, the profits from private sales going into his political account. This is a political cartoon from Ontario, and we already see political parties using the failure, failure of prohibition to garner votes. The third argument that ended prohibition in BC was that a lack of regulations on manufacturing alcohol was making it more dangerous for people who did drink. 
Not only was prohibition produce, producing a new dangerous class of criminals and corrupting our police and politicians, it made all drinkers susceptible to injury and death. Finally, legal alcohol production would be a taxable source of government revenue. And this was arguably the most important reason that prohibition didn't last in Canada at the federal level. That said, just because alcohol prohibition ended for settlers did not mean that Indigenous people were afforded the same rights. After both World War I and World War II, Indigenous veterans were banned from Royal Canadian Legions because the Indian Act still stipulated that they cannot enter licensed establishments. In 1951, a special committee amended this, but with the catch that provincial governments had, the petition, had to petition the General and Council in order to fully implement the amended amendment within their jurisdictions. That many provinces didn't bother contributed to Indigenous peoples who did drink having to consume alcohol rapidly and secretly, which in turn fed into racist myths about Indigenous people not being able to handle the, their liquor. And it wasn't until 1985 that Indigenous specific liquor offences were repealed, and the authority for liquor legislation on reserves was transferred to banned councils. So the case of alcohol, therefore, has all the harm, hallmarks of drugs that remain prohibited under the CDSA. Alcohol was originally prohibited at the intersections of settler state formation and capitalist development. It was ideologically justified through a lens of white Christian morality and gendered social control. It was leveraged to regulate poor indigenous and racialized people's access to public space. It bred organized crime and corruption. It drove drinking underground and fueled the dangerous and unpredictable alcohol market. And it ended for some people once governments realized that legal production and distribution of alcohol was an even more effective economic and regulatory tool than prohibition had been. A century later, the federal government has arrived at a similar conclusion around cannabis. It was removed as a, as a scheduled substance from the CDSA in 2018. Yet drugs such as heroin, or what was heroin, cocaine, crack cocaine, and methamphetamine remain illegal. Why is that? To answer that, we again need to return to those lenses of power, profit, and the function of government in a nation state that was founded on stolen land and that actively participates in a global system of monopoly capitalism. We also need to expand our lens beyond just our domestic borders. Canada is a settler colonial nation, but it has also become an imperial one. Some of you may be familiar with the now viral meme, Canada is just three oil and gas companies in a trench coat or three mining companies in a trench coat. The backbone of our national GDP comes from natural resource extraction still. And much of this wealth is generated abroad and specifically in the global south. As of December 2022, Canada was home to nearly half of the world's publicly listing mining and mineral exploration companies. 2001 stats from the federal government identified 748 of them as having Canadian mining assets located in 96 foreign countries worth a total of $195.9 billion. And despite what the state and corporate actors might say about our program of extractivism, these figures are not achieved through fair, transparent, and mutually beneficial economic exchange. This is an image of Mariano Aberco Roblero. He was a Mexican businessman and environmental activist who was fatally shot in 2009 after organizing protests against the Calgary headquartered Black Fire Exploration Limited and its payback mining project in his home state. Before his death, Aberco credibly alleged that Black Fire workers were acting as shock troops against protesters. He was detained by undercover police for eight days after a complaint was filed by Black Fire's public relations officer. And he was the repeated victim of threats, harassment, and a home invasion during which he was badly beaten and his wife held at gunpoint. No charges have been laid in Aberco's death, but a 2013 report by Mining Watch Canada points out that three company associates were arrested in connection with it, and that every Canadian Blackfire employee fled the area shortly after it happened. Mining Watch and the Justice and Corporate Accountability Project have also presented ample evidence that the Canadian Embassy knew about dissensions at the mining site, but that its virtually unconditional support for Blackfire was a disincentive for the company to comply with local and international law. These allegations form the basis of the Abercos family's years-long battle with Canada's public sector integrity commissioner. The Supreme Court of Canada denied their appeal to hear a complaint first filed in 2018. And the complaint detailed the myriad ways that the embassy undermined its own policies as a civil service branch of the Canadian government to facilitate dialogue between the conflicting parties. 
a judge from the Federal Court of Appeal even conceded, and I'm quoting, that perhaps Aberko would not have been murdered if the embassy had acted in a certain way, but the same ruling determined that Kisik was not obligated to read his family's complaint, let alone investigate it. And Aberko's death was part of a much broader pattern in countries experiencing Canadian-led resource rushes. And it is the war on drugs that produces the conditions that enable Canadian resource companies to operate with near total impunity in the global south. Rewinding, in 1971, then US President Richard Nixon's famous declaration that drug abuse in the US was public enemy number one, set the stage for a program of mass incarceration and police surveillance in black, brown and poor communities in the US. It also ushered in a concerted effort by the West to destabilize communist and left-wing regimes under the guise of fighting cross-border narcotics trafficking. Since then, Western states, Canada included, have built immense police and military capabilities in countries that are abundant with natural resources, where resistance to extraction has a stronghold and that contain major drug staging and shipping arteries. In Canada, it's our Department of Global Affairs and its anti-crime capacity building program that function as the overarching framework through which the uh, federal government delivers equipment to, tactically trains, and provides on the ground aid to enforcement networks throughout the developing world. And on paper, this is meant to strengthen borders, liquidate drug crops, diminish gang and cartel activity, and tackle related crimes. But on closer inspection, it is a backdoor for extraction. First, strong militaries and police forces in the Global South benefit Canadian resource companies by inflaming tensions at the local level. Companies may hire armed forces under the pretext of cleaning production areas of drug-related crime when they acquire the title rights to land. Journalist Don Paley compares this to ideological cleansing because enforcement often filters into strike and blockade breaking and the murders of land defenders. Next, militarization also breeds paramilitarization. Indiscriminately funneling weapons and money to national leaders means that some of them will be diverted to rebel and guerrilla groups. This has created dynamics where these groups frequently displace peasant and rural populations. And this directly helps extraction companies become entrenched in the region, as does the fact that some of these groups are cartels who are embedded in the drug trade. Conflicts between cartels and Western-backed military and policing groups then justified the provision of even more weapons, money, and military training to national leaders who at the macro policy level have signed bilateral and multinational trade agreements with the West that wither domestic state control over natural research, resources in exchange for promising to fight drug-related crime. An underreported part of this scheme relates to Canada's foreign aid policies. Under Prime Minister Stephen Harper, what was the Canadian International Development Agency merged with the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade into the Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Development. It subsumed aid policy under donor-driven mandates, codifying resource shareholder interest in security through anti-drug promises as a central requirement for receiving humanitarian assistance. And if the face of Canada's foreign policies softened when Justin Trudeau was elected, the commercial self-interest underneath it did not the federal liberal, liberals continue to prioritize social, economic, and development transfers to countries that are enriched with national resources and embedded in the drug, drug trade. For more on this, I recommend seeing Harm Reduction International's recent report. The end game of the circular strategy is then to present research projects as solutions to the economic depressions and disasters that Western interventionism on the basis of the drug war causes. So when you see reports of cartel or drug-related crime erupting in Mexico and throughout the developing world, know that we as Canadians are directly implicated in it. And these are some of the reasons why I say that the war on drugs has been an unparalleled success for Canada in the international arena. But what about domestically? As Canada's support for the drug war has ratcheted up in the global south, some of our domestic policies have softened. And this has led to immense confusion about drug policies in Canada which has not been helped by both opportunistic politicians from every political party and media outlets routinely publishing disinformation about our drug policy landscape. So just a few moments of myth debunking is warranted here. First, neither the federal government nor any provincial or territorial government has legalized drugs, and sadly they have no plans to. The CDSA is still very much intact and will be for the foreseeable future. Prohibition still forms the backbone of our drug-related policies. 
Most of our drug policy related dollars are still spent on street level policing and enforcement. Therefore, the unregulated drug supply gets increasingly toxic, volatile and deadly every day. And drug policy reform in Canada has been incremental at best and counterproductive at worst. British Columbia has led some of these incremental reforms. Namely, at the onset of the coronavirus pandemic, the federal government did relax guidelines around prescribing what we call safe supply. Safe supply refers to medical professionals offering prescriptions for pharmaceutical grade alternatives to the illegal drug supply. Because drug policies are overseen by the provinces and territories, only some regions have any access to safe supply whatsoever, and BC as a province is technically one of them. Now, the web of disinformation that has proliferated in BC about safe supply is vast and wildly disproportionate to what it is functionally achieving. So to address just a bit of it, like I said, safe supply tends to take the form of pharmaceutical grade hydromorphone or another type of opioid that is less potent than what one is accustomed to getting from the street based drug supply. Some very limited options for stimulant and benzodiazepine safe supply exist, but they are sorely lacking. Although many people who use drugs prefer to smoke their drugs, and nearly two thirds of overdose fatalities in, this, in BC this year came from smoking, safe supply excludes inhalation options. And from day one, safe supply has been tethered to the constructs of addiction medicine. By this, I mean that in order to be eligible for any prescription, a person generally has to be diagnosed with a severe treatment resistant substance use disorder. They often have to prove to their prescriber that other forms of treatment such as inpatient care with the goal of abstinence or opioid substitution therapy such as methadone or suboxone have failed. This is just a screenshot from the BCCSU's risk mitigation guidelines that outlines kind of how tightly safe supply is regulated. And many people report feeling like doctors are withholding prescriptions for safe supply from them until they prove they are sick enough to deserve it. Of course, many die before they ever get there. Additionally, access to safe supply is fractured and uneven throughout the province. People in remote and rural areas, including on reserve, often don't live within traveling distance of a prescriber. This excludes them from safe supply because unlike met other medications, acquiring and keeping a prescription is highly time and labor intensive. Some people are only offered witnessed ingestion, meaning that a pharmacist or prescriber oversees them take their doses. And I'd like you to consider how inconvenient it would be for you to travel two, three or four times a day to a clinic or pharmacy. Some people are allowed carries or doses to take with them, but they rarely get more than a few days worth at a time. They also report being abruptly cut off from their prescriptions if they miss a single appointment. Ultimately then, whether someone can get safe supply and the form it takes comes down to the whims of individual prescribers, many of whom still regard all drug users with hostility and suspicion. <sighs> Rates of safe supply are also going down. Recently, the province reported that from March to Jul July of this year, the number of people in BC prescribed safe supply dropped by 11%. Currently, less than 4,500 people have any prescription at all. To offer context for that number, it is estimated that approximately 100,000 people in BC meet the criteria for an opioid use disorder or an opioid addiction. Many, many more are recreational drug users who do not qualify for safe supply because they are not considered at high enough risk of death or because they don't even know it exists because they don't reg regularly engage with the medical system. So given these very modest statistics, why are we hearing so much about the dangers of safe supply? Why are we seeing headlines like these? And why are these headlines juxtaposed with assurances from the province that safe supply is readily available to anyone who wants it and that the province is doing everything it can to separate people from the unregulated drug supply? So the first group of headlines like these are outright disinformation. British Columbia's chief coroner, Lisa Lapointe, consistently confirms that safe supply is not contributing to fatal overdose. I'm just going to read a quote from her here. There's a small group of individuals who are using this as a political weapon, and I feel very, very badly that they're using this as a political weapon, literally, on the bodies of 12,000 people who have died. Disappointing is too soft a word for how I feel about that. It's reprehensible that this is a medical crisis that people are trying to politicize. I can tell you we do postmortem tox toxicology testing on every person who dies when there's any inkling that substances may be involved. 
you're not seeing safer supply increasing in the tests that we're seeing. You're not seeing people dying as a result of safe supply. Safe supply is not contributing to overdose deaths. Those are all still being, uh, those are all still being caused by the unregulated and illegal drug market. Safe supply is also not flooding the streets. It is not being used to initiate hordes of young people into drug use. And it is definitely not fueling a new opioid crisis. Yet I do wanna flag something that LaPointe has said here. She says, this is a medical crisis that people are trying to politicize. And it is accurate to call fatal overdoses a medical crisis in the sense that literal death is a medical issue or a medical phenomenon. But I would offer that it is naive to su suggest that overdoses shouldn't be politicized. I hope by now to have illuminated some of the ways that drug prohibition is profoundly political as our government decisions about who lives, who dies, and the quality of life people have access to. I also wanna hone in on why framing the unregulated drug crisis as a medical issue has perpetuated, sorry, I'm getting a bit cold, uh, government inaction led to increased overdose fatalities and allowed human rights abuses to proliferate among drug using communities. Since the 2016 overdose emergency declaration, and as BC has introduced incremental reforms we have seen our governments increasingly attempt to position drug users as sick people who need help. Ostensibly, making drug use medical is an improvement from total criminalization. And in some ways, this is true, but we haven't actually left criminalization behind. Instead, we have seen a conjoining or a twinning of criminal and medical approaches to drug use. And both paradigms can be functionally identical if we understand them as ways to regulate, control, surveil, punish, dehumanize, and disempower drug users. What actually happens when we understand someone as sick? And specifically, what happens when we understand them as having chronic relapsing brain diseases? We don't trust them. We don't believe that they are capable of rational decision making. We don't sense that they know what's best for themselves. And we are able to justify a host of policies and laws that undermine bodily autonomy and the right to informed consent. The data bears this out. Our current government has encouraged us to treat drug use as a sickness or as a disorder, as a way to destigmatize it. But a huge body of research has proven that this understanding of drug use in users actually increases stigma. Several system, systematic reviews and meta-analyses of medical approaches to drug use demonstrate that they are associated with irrationality and unpredictability. They invoke stereotypes of dangerousness and they instigate, instigate rejection tendencies among lay people. They also undermine health and social outcomes in no small part because these stereotypes are reproduced by medical professionals who are duly motivated to frame drug use as a sickness for reasons related to power and profit. Returning to safe supply and the idea that all drug users need permission from the medical profession to access it, some of the most vocal opponents of safe supply are addiction medicine physicians. Why would physicians want to prevent their patients from having access to medication that reduce their risk of overdose fatalities? Again, through the lenses of power and profit, this actually makes a lot of sense. We are taught that medicine is a neutral, objective institution, yet I've already told you how beliefs about drug use and therefore addiction are anything but neutral or objective. As rates of overdose have increased, so have the number of physicians claiming to be addiction experts. Addiction medicine specifically is a relatively new subfield of medicine. Currently, the Royal College of Physicians and Servants physicians and surgeons confers no specialty or subspecialty in addiction medicine. So Canadian physicians who identify themselves as practicing addiction medicine often have obtained a, cert a certificate through the USA. Many of them have leveraged assumptions about drug users and namely that all drug users are addicted to drugs to attain professional dominance and to materially profit off of the available, available population of addicts. As they promote myths about safe supply, they rarely disclose the conflicts of interest that contribute to their biases. As just one example, a few open letters, this was originally gonna say one open letter, but I've now had to update it. A few open letters have been recently published by a group of addiction medicine physicians directed at the Federal Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. In it, the authors claim without providing any empirical evidence that offering people free government funded drugs is contributing to increased rates of addiction. It erroneously characterizes safe supply as being unlimited. It also claims that people who are prescribed safe supply are reselling it as a significant source of profit. 
in concrete terms regarding why these physicians would be opposed to safe supply, all of those who signed the letter, of those who signed the letter, many own shares in or right, right own medical monitoring companies. These companies conduct biological testing on workers who have been told by their employers that abstinence from substance is a condition of returning to work or of staying employed. And in BC specifically, the College of Physicians and Surgeons has allowed addiction physicians to have financial interests in the medical monitoring companies that their patients are required to attend. This means that if a worker is identified as having a substance related issue, even if they have never been under the influence at work, they are often referred to an independent medical examiner. These folks then have the power to diagnose someone with a substance use disorder and prescribe a treatment regime that includes regular monitor regular medical monitoring from a company that they profit from or own. They may charge workers thousands of dollars out of pocket each month. And for more information on this, uh, I'd like you to see uh, Byron Wood struggle as a nurse. He was mandated by his employer to enroll in abstinence-based addiction treatment, and he was fired because he wouldn't attend Alcoholics Anonymous thereafter. He filed a human rights complaint against Vancouver Coastal Health, alleging that he was discriminated against as an atheist which prompted VCH to change their policies. He has since gone on to fund the nonprofit Workers for Ethical Substance Use Policy, which advocates for change for harmful workplace substance use policies. Similarly, some of the signatories of this letter own or work for profit, uh, for-profit methadone clinics. Others still are employed by private addiction treatment centers, and others still offer some combination of private virtual prescribing government consulting about addiction and abstinence-based recovery resources, all of which generate revenue for them and are permitted under federal and provincial law. These conflicts of interest aren't new. When you know where to look, you begin to see a recurring cast of characters who appear to oppose progressive drug policy reform where and whenever it is being proposed. I could dedicate an entire talk to the treatment industry in BC, and I would like to, Time permitting, I cannot, uh, but you should know that neither the federal nor provincial governments regulate addiction treatment. There is no centralized database of addiction treatment centers. We have no way of tracking outcomes. But we do know that instances of abuse, assault, and death within treatment centers are far more common than they should be. We also know that the vast majority of addiction treatment is still offered as abstinence-based and is rooted in quasi or outright religious programming. Even supposedly public, Addiction treatment is often partially privatized. Many treatment centers have arrangements with the provincial government that involve them housing people who have relinquished their income assistance or disability checks directly to the treatment center. And treatment in this country has been made into a de facto for low income, low barrier housing, but people aren't protected by the Residential Tenancy Act and don't have any of the legal protections we would typically expect from rental agreements. This means that we often see people evicted after resuming substance use, even if they have paid, right when they have reduced drug tolerance and the rates of fatal overdose have increased exponentially. Being released from treatment in hospital is a strong predictor of fatal overdose, especially when people are released right back into homelessness and the same unsupported, unstable environments that drove their drug use in the first place. So given this context, it is no wonder that medical and treatment professionals are threatened by the prospect of safe supply. For the few people who can access it, an emergent body of research shows that it is demonstrably linked to reduced engagement with the unregulated drug market, improved outcomes relating to stability, housing, and employment, fewer emergency room visits, and general well-being. Very bluntly, the laws of supply and demand apply here, and without a steady stream of addicts to treat, addiction medicine and the addiction treatment industry would go out of business. These are just a few examples of how our current drug policy environment and this twinning of criminal and medical approaches to drug use produce addiction. We are encouraged to lump all drug users together under the sole category of addict. And these folks, me included for many years, get labeled as such on our medical and other institutional records. Once this occurs, we are forced to enter intensive dehumanizing regimes of medical surveillance and control that often make us even more sick. And from experience, being told over and over that you are an addict molds your subjectivity and you begin to think and act accordingly. Now, this narrative of all drug users as sick also benefits our governments. It gets them off the hook for their failure to regulate the drug supply. And if overdoses are simply the product of addiction, and if addicts are just sick people, 
We get to avoid difficult conversations about all the ways that prohibition serves the interests of power and profit domestically and internationally. A crucial part of this discussion, of course, has to do with poverty. Much of the reaction we are seeing in BC to policy reform is grounded in a simple disdain for poor people. This applies to both the policy models of safe supply and decriminalization. And I want to be really clear and pragmatic about both safe supply and decrim. Safe supply is sometimes sold on the street or diverted as it is referred to. However, this relates to the fact that hydromorphone and the options that exist under safe supply aren't strong enough to meet people's needs. And it also relates to the fact that people are being blamed for diversion tend to be the most impoverished and selling pills for a few dollars may be their only source of income. Decriminalization has also highlighted how deep this hatred of poor people goes. In January of this year, BC became the first province in Canada to introduce a pilot for decriminalization. From the beginning, the government has framed decrim as a solution to the unregulated drug crisis, but this is not the purpose of decriminalization. Decriminalization does not replace unregulated drugs with safe drugs, and its core purpose should be to reduce engagement with the criminal justice system. In the months leading up to it, drug users and advocates emphasized that the pilot did not go far enough. Um, and I'm not going to go into all the ways in which it doesn't go far enough because I am paying some attention to time here. Um, but I do want to point out that as soon as the pilot started, municipalities across the province began passing bylaws that recriminalized public drug use. And I realized that I have totally forgotten about the PowerPoint. So I'm going to catch up. Uh, so we have seen a wave of bylaws proposed or passed in the last six months. These are just a few examples. They are again paradoxically appearing in regions where city council have also posed the opening and operated of operation of safe consumption sites and where drug users are being prevented from gathering at all through the use of bylaws. This often is occurring also where there are huge gaps in health and social supports. And again, think back to alcohol prohibition and the language that was used to justify it. The justifications that are being used for these bylaws are over a century old. They are predicated on the assumptions that drug users are inherently dangerous, especially to children, that drug users undermine commercial interests, that drug users are not part of the tax paying public, that drug users are reasonably and naturally excluded from conceptions of community, and that drug user safety is not relevant. And fundamentally, these bylaws have not been about drug use. They have been about restricting poor people's access to public space and hiding poverty from view. Just point out that last month, CDPC, in conjunction with Pivot Legal Society, sent a joint submission to the United States Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Homelessness saying as much. It details some of the ways that drug prohibition intersects with the criminalization of poverty how both fuel cycles of poverty and homelessness, and how both ultimately function to undermine Canada's human rights obligations under the human, human rights treaties it is acceded to. And here we also see the failure of medical approaches to drug use. Suggesting that drug users are sick people has not materially reduced the discrimination they experience. It has simply added fuel to the rhetoric that poor drug users or people whose drug use is visible because they are poor are dangerous, corrupting, and sinister. And this has also driven calls for involuntary or forced treatment. And unfortunately, the province has caved to the pressure they have been getting from municipalities. On September 18th, the province announced that drug use would be banned or recriminalized within 15 meters of any play structure in a playground, a spray or waiting pool or a skate park. And then on October 4th, it introduced Bill 34, which would will recriminalize drug use in almost all public spaces. And I really want to draw your attention to the language that Premier David Eby used when introducing Bill 34. Again, we see the conflation of all drug use with addiction and addiction being conflated with visible poverty. He says, British Columbians overwhelmingly agree addiction is a health matter. At the same time, they're also concerned about open drug use in public space, especially near where kids play. Bill 34 has nothing to do with addiction. It is about visible drug use, and drug use is visible because people are poor. Bill 34 most recently was uh, passed, but it has not come into force. There is currently a lawsuit trying to prevent it from doing so. I'll also note that on the same day, 
that Bill 34 was introduced, uh, the Greater Vancouver Homeless Count data was released. And it reported that over a three year period, rates of homelessness have increased by 32% in Vancouver. These numbers are staggering and they're a big part of why we're seeing so much hostility toward poor and homeless drug users. So ultimately, the province's very tentative approach to policy reform has instigated a total category collapse of drug use, addiction, poverty, homelessness, social disorder, and crime, while the province promises that it is doing everything they can to save lives. In reality, since the emergency declaration in 2016, the only things we have really seen have been a ballooning bureaucracy, including the creation of a new Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions, we have seen hundreds of millions of dollars being directed to management and other mid-level positions whose role it is to shield the government from responsibility for its failure to regulate the drug supply. We've seen an endless stream of research, data gathering processes, reports, and community consultations about the problem with no real move to implement the solution. And I truly believe that if the government were doing all it could to separate people from the unregulated drug supply, narratives around drug policy would be very different. If drug use had truly been decriminalized, if safe supply was truly available to all people who need it in the form that they require it, we would not see the rates of death that we do. We would have seen a vast improvement in quality of life. And conservative governments and other folks would not have the ability to weaponize these incremental reforms to advocate for expanded criminalization. We would also be able to have mature, reasonable discussions about issues that intersect with drug policy, but are not actually drug policy. Namely, the, rate, the fact that rates of poverty and homelessness are increasing across the country. But because we are not having those conversations, drug users, and specifically people whose drug use intersects with poverty, racism, and disability are still being blamed for moral and social decline, crime and social disorder, and economic hardship. So I realize I'm running out of time, but I do have a few solutions. Uh, what are they? Where am I? Okay. Uh, yeah, drug users, people who use drugs, groups of drug users have solutions and have been yelling about the solutions for very, very long. We need to actually decriminalize drug possession and consumption. I invite you to uh, turn your attention to de Decriminalization Done Right, a rights-based path for drug policy. It's a civil society platform that uh, was collaboratively published in 2021 with imp input from the legal, human rights, public health sectors, and it is informed by the expertise of people who use drugs. It is grounded in contemporary evidence and it lays out a model for decriminalization that supports public and community health and human rights by decoupling drug use from the criminal legal system and medical forms of punishment, such as drug treatment courts and mandatory addiction treatment. Next, we need to immediately scale up access to safe supply. This is the Canadian Association of People Who Use Drugs' safe supply concept document. Uh, Kaput is technically the entity that coined the term safe supply. And there are many, many groups kind of discussing what safe supply could actually look like. I also invite you to explore uh, the CDPC's Imagine Safe Supply Research Project. Uh, for safe supply to truly make an impact, we need to look far beyond prescriber based models and models that force drug users to quasi consent to regimes of medical surveillance. Specifically, we need to see community controlled safe supply that takes the form of compassion clubs. And local examples of this until very recently have existed. Um, and I'm just pausing for a moment because again, this event was, was postponed and I was talking about the drug user liberation front in the current tense and I'm having to switch to the past tense. Up until very recently, there was a group on the downtown east side called the Drug User Liberation Fund that purchased quantities of heroin, cocaine and methamphetamine in bulk tested them with support from a research institution, safely sealed them into personal doses, clearly labeled the packages and distributed them to community members who had been verified as legal adults, legal adults and members of another local drug user advocacy group. Descriptive results were being systematically tracked and at the one year mark, the club had reported no overdose incidents related to the drugs they were receiving Members were reporting reduced engagement with the illegal drug market, substantially reduced negative interactions with police, decreased hospitalizations, decreased drug-related violence, reduced reliance on illegal activities, 
improve connections with family and friends, increase use of health and social services, and improve mental and physical well-being. And very recently, the Drug User Liberation Front was raided. Its founders were arrested. We don't yet know whether they will, they will face criminal charges, um, but that is likely. And the VPD who made the arrest bluntly admitted that Delph was doing good work, that the arrest would probably re result in increased harm. The province has said as much, but has refused to uh, kind of intervene on their behalf. I'll also point out that again, very recently, the chief coroner uh, convened a, a panel uh, to review drug toxicity over a period of nine months and concluded that report, a death review panel report, with the key recommendation that safe supply be made available through community driven models, such as compassion clubs. The same day that report was released, our Ministry of Mental Health and Addictions unequivocally rejected that recommendation. So again, when we hear that the province is doing everything it can to separate people from the unregulated drug supply, it is not, that is a lie. Um, moving on, and this might be a bit controversial, we need to stop directing so much funding to research. Research is not bad, inherently, but there are many, many researchers who have built pretty illustrious careers on the back of exploited people, including communities of drug user, uh, users. The Vancouver Area Network of Drug Users published, in collaboration with researchers, a research manifesto a few years back that talked about the ways in which drug using communities are exploited and engaged in non-reciprocal relations with researchers. So we do need research to evaluate program outcomes and do related work. We do not need more research identifying the problem. We know what the problem is and we know what the solutions are. Related, please no more government commissioned reports, reviews, analyses, investigations, quasi consultations. We know, we know what the problems are. We know what the solutions are. What we do need though, is fact-based drug education in schools to equip young people with the information they need to make informed choices about drug use. Young people have been almost completely excluded from conversations about drug use other than when used uh, as pawns. And they are far more astute and competent than we give them credit for. Rather than rely on just say no drug education that is outdated and inaccurate, we should equip young people to make informed choices. And we still need addiction treatment. That is controversial even in my circles. I am someone who says, yes, addiction treatment is a necessity for some of us. But for it to be consensual, it can't be a substitute for housing. It can't be a court ordered alternative to jail. And it can't be the only way for someone to secure a bed or food. It also must be grounded in contemporary evidence, not archaic quasi or fully religious programming. There must be strict regulatory oversight. There must be a provincial database and federal databases of all substance use treatment services and facilities that should clearly detail the out of pocket costs for individuals seeking services, the total dollar amount of government investment in each service, and the treatment modalities available. Specific standardized and transparent mechanisms should be designed to track services outcomes. There also must be some sort of accreditation system that assigns government representatives to intervene when treatment centers depart from expected standards of care. And we also must ensure that public funding for treatment is contingent upon regularly demonstrating that standards of care are being upheld. Moving on, we need disability accommodations that include basic income support for those of us who can't always participate in the formal economy and for whom the pace and expectations of the world are sometimes unrealistic. I can guarantee you that many disabled and mad people, me included, not have ever started using illegal drugs or using illegal drugs in ways that are chaotic and compulsive if we lived in a world that accommodated mental and physical differences and didn't rely on shuttering disabled people behind the locked doors of institution. We also need to invest in robust poverty reduction initiatives and redirect money currently spent on enforcement, first responders reversing overdoses and ineffective treatment to housing, health and social services, maternal and parental services to prevent drug use from being used as a reason to remove children from their families. And all of this should be happening en route to fully legalizing and regulating the entire drug supply. To close, this is a regulatory spectrum for drug policy. 
On one end of the spectrum, we have unregulated criminal markets, meaning that under the unregulated drug market, there is a lot of profit being made. It is being made by organized crime syndicates, um, not really by drug sellers or people who get labeled as drug dealers, because more often than not, they are subsistence sellers. And there's a lot of kind of racist myth attached to people who use drugs. But profit is being made. Profit is also being made by enforcement initiatives that are illicit under our government. On the other end of the regulatory spectrum is the regulated legal market. And that speaks to how drugs like alcohol are regulated. And I'll point out that I don't necessarily agree with the way that we approach alcohol in society. Um, and I say that not just as an alcoholic, but as someone who watches alcohol be marketed and watches corporate profit be made. And when we talk about legalizing and regulating all drugs, we're not talking about either ends of the spectrum. We're not saying that drugs should be advertised to young people. We're not saying that boutique heroin shops should be, you know, advertising on your social media feeds. We're saying that for people who are already using drugs or who are going to use drugs, there should be a way to access them that ensures that they know precisely what they are getting and in what quantity that does not put people at risk of criminal or medical penalties and that promotes public health, human rights and safety for all. All that being said, the war on drugs has been immensely successful in consolidating power among political and economic elites, in generating profit, and in sustaining the settler colonial land and resource theft and racialized labor exploitation upon which this nation was founded. I am aware that power never concedes itself willingly. I am aware that profit and protecting the profit motives of the powerful remains the primary motivation for every policy decision at every level of government. And the function of government has not fundamentally changed in the last 200 years because we are still a settler colonial nation state that actively participates in a global system of monopoly capitalism. And this is why it is not the fault of any one political party that people are dying from the unregulated drug crisis and why we cannot expect any one political party to fix it, despite all of them cynically using overdose fatalities and drug users suffering to score cheap points by blaming the other parties. And this is why talking about drug use and policy the way I do remains controversial. Uh, and I will leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. That, that was wonderful. And we have the opportunity now for questions from the audience. And, and once again, we would like to encourage you to submit your questions via Slido. Um, I have a couple of questions here, but if, if you have others that you would like to, to add, uh, I encourage you to, to visit the, uh, the site. Uh, so there are a couple of questions I'll start with. Um, and, and the first one is, as someone who doesn't like labels, I was wondering where you stand on the argument and debate of labeling autism spectrum as a difference versus disability. Specifically, do you see parallels of this debate in relation to mental health patients with substance abuse as label? Yeah, I sure do. Um, labels are complicated. I personally these days just identify as mad, disabled sometimes strategically as a drug user, depending on context. Um, and I think there's an immense overlap between kind of the folks who, for whom the kind of neurodiversity paradigm applies for those of us who identify as mad, for those of us who identify as disabled and labels aside, I think we share converging interests and whether you wanna call folks merely different merely disabled. I don't think it really matters. I think what's more important is kind of the material interests that both disenfranch all of those kind of categories to begin with um, and the reforms that are required to accommodate all of us. I'm not sure if that's a comprehensive answer, um, but I'm not gonna keep talking. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Um, so I, there's a second question here. Uh, what are your thoughts on how to do policy right 
for psychedelic assisted therapy and further, helping further shift the attitude of government and public opinion towards this potentially life-saving treatment. Oh boy, I have to do a whole nother lecture. Um, psychedelics are drugs. Therefore, I believe psychedelics should be legalized and regulated. Right now, psychedelics are en route to being legalized and regulated through very rigid medical models that are for profit. And I see that as a glaring problem. Predominantly, the folks who are advocating for the legal regulation of psychedelics are not Indigenous peoples who have historically used psychedelics. They are folks who have kind of taken, and I would say co-opted psychedelic use. Uh, and who have, I think, garnered public support for psychedelic use, A, by framing it as a treatment for other forms of drug use slash addiction for mental health conditions. Um, and I think that really constrains the conversations we could be having. And I think some of the public support we have seen for psychedelics has been directly um generated on the backs of people who use other illegal drugs we refer to this as psychedelic exceptionalism or as uh, engendering drug hierarchies where people who use drugs of objection like crack like meth are kind of thrown under the bus because folks who seek to gain from the legal regulation of psychedelics try to distance psychedelic use from those types of drugs and i believe that does everyone save for those few people uh, an immense disservice. So yes, I think psychedelics should be legalized and regulated. I take strong issue with the route that we are going in. And sadly, that train has long ago left the station. Um, yeah. Thanks. Maybe if I can add a follow up of my own. It, do you feel based on what you said that there's maybe some racist undercurrents to how psychedelics are perceived versus other kinds of drugs? Sure. Um, can you elaborate? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm... I, I, I'm a chemist. I, this, is, okay. this is deep territory for me. I mean, there is racism in the sense that historically, you know, psychedelics have been owned and used by Indigenous communities and the folks that are looking to profit off of psychedelic legalization are predominantly white. There's that element. There's the element that other drugs that remain illegal are typically associated with racialized communities. Um, and so we have kind of a face of psychedelic use now that is, again, very white. Um, and when I say that proponents of psychedelic legalization tend to evoke these drug hierarchies and separate psychedelic use from other drug use that is all imbued with racial stereotypes um yeah yeah thanks uh so we have another question uh how do you suggest to combat coordinated misinformation campaigns about safe supply and decriminalization if i had the one answer to that or a better answer i don't think we'd be here um that is something that occupies a lot of my thought processes and a lot of our collective conversations um I mean, the, the mis and disinformation is, is much easier to proliferate because it taps into long held beliefs about drug use and users and poverty and all of those things. So kind of countering the narratives because it is, I think, um, because the narratives we are trying to promote are kind of confronting power rather than re-entrenching it, they are harder to have gain traction. I think those of us who are kind of those of us who share similar values and have similar objectives need to be in good communication with one another. That includes, you know, a lot of my job is behind the scenes stuff um, that never reaches public or kind of ascends into the level of like a public relations campaign. But there's a lot of kind of discussion around just information sharing and needing to kind of be um, kind of on our front foot rather than reacting to bad policy decisions and disinformation. And I am cautiously optimistic that we are en route to kind of shifting some of that, but it is certainly an uphill battle. Um, and I would invite anyone who wants to get involved in either combating disinformation or just kind of advocating for policy reform more broadly to be in touch. Um, because right now we, yeah, the, this last year in particular has been very, very difficult in that realm. Um, drug policy has 
been very intentionally elevated as a wedge issue um, at the federal and provincial levels um, by a very well-funded and well-resourced network of folks who are very firmly committed to, to regression. And we don't have quite that type of resourcing, unfortunately. So the next question, I think, feeds very nicely into that point, which is, what is the most effective way for people to pressure politicians to adopt policy that will stop people dying? Um, in the very short and immediate term, um, get in touch with folks who are already kind of doing that work on a longer term basis, CDPC included, but certainly not limited to CDPC. Um, write to your politicians, that feels almost futile and silly to say, particularly given the current climate, um, but connect with folks who are doing more than just the writing, who are doing the campaigning over a longer term basis. Um, drug policy is a multi-domain issue. If you think it doesn't affect you, it does, whether directly or indirectly. And so that coalition building piece is really vital. Um, and on that note, we have been doing a fair bit of it, reaching out into kind of the disability justice space, um, working with unions, for instance, if you are part of a union and want to uh, develop motions for your union to adopt in the realms of drug policy, we can, we want to do that with you. Uh, we are doing some of that, but we want to do more of it. Um, so yeah, directly, you know, kind of contacting political offices is one thing to do, but I think over time, all of our work needs to be informed by kind of a democratic process of decision making done with a broader coalition. Thanks, and I will note gratifyingly, that was the question that was uh, upvoted perhaps the most. So obviously a lot of people are very interested in, in how they can help. Um, we have platforms coming. We have things to be released soon, so yeah. Uh, so another question is, what is the most feasible pathway to get non-prescribed safe supply operational? I mean, it already was. Um, like I said, there, there were folks, there are folks who are doing that illegally and have been trying to do so legally and have been blocked from doing so. Um, so, it's it's so frustrating to to talk about this in part because like those pathways are there there are you know exemption requests that can be filed um those routes exist and community groups have tried to pursue them and have been blocked and then ultimately criminalized um so i will not on record sit here and say you know advise people to break the law um but there are functional examples of how breaking the law actually leads to immediate outcomes um, that our political leaders are not going to simply give us. Yeah. Thanks. Um, actually, I was wondering from my own interest is, is what are your thoughts on prog programs like the, um, the uh, Vancouver Island drug check drug checking project and its its usefulness or programs like that. Do you think that those are uh, helpful? Like, do they move the needle at all? Sorry, bad pun intended. Bad, yeah. yeah no. Um. All yes. I, I'm very familiar with it. I collaborate with some of the folks involved, and all of those projects, given our current drug policy environment, are needed. Um. That being said, they are kind of mid-level interventions for a problem that has, um, again, one, one very specific solution. Um, and so that kind of ties in, I think, to harm reduction initiatives more broadly, um, things like safe consumption sites and overdose prevention sites and drug checking services, given the fact that we are still within a context of an unregulated drug supply, all of those things are necessary but they ought not to be. Um, and I'll point out that, you know, I and the people I collaborate with are often kind of targeted. Um, and it is suggested that we want to see a world where there's, you know, a safe consumption site on every corner and everyone should be carrying naloxone. And like, I actually don't want to see that world. I don't want all of us to be having to carry naloxone all the time. I don't want us to be fighting over safe consumption sites. I want us to prevent overdose. 
uh, by regulating the drug supply and by redirecting all of the money that is going to those kind of incremental interventions um, to things like poverty reduction and housing and just improvement of quality of life for communities. Yeah. Thanks. So So unfortunately, we, we're almost out of time. So I'm going to to take or ask one more question from, from the, the panel. So, uh, but we are, as I've said before, uh, we are going to continue to have a reception after this, uh, the, the formal event. So if you would like to, to chat with Nicole more, I'm sure she would be, be happy to, to talk. Um, so just to finish up with one more question, I apologize to those who asked questions and we weren't able to, to make it. Uh, this has been a very stimulating conversation. Um, so I'll just end with uh, a question from uh, the, the slider that says, can you speak more to the connection between weaponized youth, weaponizing youth, e.g. in the temperance propaganda you shared, and the ways your, our educational and drug policies are failing young drug users? Sure can. Um, yeah, I, I started with some of the temperance stuff in part to just highlight how similar the narratives around alcohol prohibition are around other drugs now. Um, and it's, you know, like I said, young people have been almost entirely excluded from, co from conversations about drug policy reform. Um, children are being used as, I would say, pawns um, to advocate for drug policy regression and entrenched criminalization, despite the fact that we know that some young people use illegal drugs and all adults who use illegal drugs were at one point children. Um, and so we really, I think, need to be emphasizing fact-based drug education in an age-appropriate way, but beginning as early as possible. Um, our drug education in schools, if it exists at all, really remains rooted in abstinence and kind of these like very outdated and antiquated kind of just say no campaigns. And so we know that because young people will use drugs, not all of them, but some of them, um, promoting abstinence only seeks or only fuels, you know, the shame around drug use. It prevents people from seeking support when they might otherwise look for it. And therefore, in turn, it fuels patterns of chaotic and compulsive use and what eventually becomes addiction uh, because folks can't have those transparent conversations with trusted people in their lives. It's also just wildly dangerous because people don't have correct information about the composition and unpredictability of the unregulated drug supply. Uh, they are not equipped to protect themselves and their peers. Um, and I'll also just touch on the fact that um, the idea that safe supply and hydromorphone specifically is being diverted to young people um, is a really common kind of piece of disinformation that is being sowed. And again, I'm not naive. I'm not claiming there is no young person who has bought any kind of diverted safe supply, but on mass and on balance, there are not hordes of young people being initiated by predatory drug sellers into drug use through diverted safe supply um, that there simply isn't enough safe supply to actually do that um, and the folks who are consuming diverted safe supply regardless of age are people who are already using drugs um, so i've kind of meandered there but to return to the question we need to be including young people in age appropriate ways in these conversations they will all grow up to be either, if not drug, if not illegal drug users, users of legal drugs. And we also need to talk about alcohol a lot better. Um, Cause right now, the way we talk about alcohol amongst young people um, kind of produces similar outcomes. It just doesn't lead to immediate death because alcohol is regulated. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, so I would like to thank you again for the, all the work that you've done and your presentation tonight, it was everything that I think the Sterling Prize Committee looks for in controversy. Uh, you are challenging and you are eloquent and, and I'd like to, to, to have everyone thank you for this wonderful presentation.
so to to wrap up, I would like to thank uh, both everyone who has joined us here in person tonight, as well as those who are are uh, joining us online. Uh, and I'd like to once again thank the the staff and the volunteers who made this event possible. Uh, and the, the, steering, the, the Sterling Prize Committee, uh, I would also like to thank and, and the team that supports them uh, year round. Uh, just to finally, I would like to plug the Sterling Prize uh, very briefly because, of course, every year we rely on nominations. Uh, and the, if people aren't nominated, then nobody's going to win the award. Uh, so I would like to uh, just uh, let people know that they, there will be a call going out soon for the next year's Sterling Prize. And if you know somebody who you feel should be recognized, we, we encourage you to, to nominate them. Uh, so finally, once again, I would just like to mention we do have a reception afterwards. And thank you all. And especially, Nicole, thank you. Uh, this has been a wonderful event. <laughs>